I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh undergraduate school, not law school. I'm a graduate of University of Maryland Law School, and I want to make sure my friends in Maryland know that I, it, was, it was a law school. Yeah. If the senator would yield, I, I certainly retract my statement on that, but I feel badly that you didn't graduate from the University of Pittsburgh, as did I. Well, I, I was afraid to apply. I wasn't sure I could get in, so it was, it was a little rough. The second point is on a, on a more substantive matter on this debate. I just really want to point out that the requests that were made for waivers between 2000 and 2009 were from the requirement, the final requirement. They didn't seek to bring forward a demonstration program or a different way to get to their results. The difference here is that states can, should have the flexibility to be able to come in with innovative ways if they accomplish at least what we set out in law for them to accomplish. In fact, these demonstration waivers, they'll have to do better at, at, on the end result on, on work, people working. I just really wanted to point that out because I thought there, was a, there were differences from, from the prior requests that were made and Secretary Sebelius' um, response. Uh, on, Madam President, I would ask unanimous consent that the following staff of the Senate Finance Committee be afforded privileges for the duration of the consideration of the continuing resolution. Renee Adoseya, Sarah Butler, Talitha James, Amanda Sellers, Brian Watt, and Daniel Lind. With that objection, so ordered. Madam President. Senator Peter. Well, I'll just add that uh, if they want that type of authority, states should come to the Congress and ask for it because we put that authority uh, subject to Congress uh, decision making. And it shouldn't be done unilaterally by an out of control uh, approach by the executive branch. And that's what's involved here, and it's important. Uh, you know, whether, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we ought to be standing up for the legislative branch and our rights and our prerogatives and powers. And uh, there's nothing that says that the states can't add work requirements that are legitimate work requirements in, in, in the statute. They didn't need this type of a unilateral, unilateral decision by the HHS department to do that. That's, that's the point. Madam President. The Senator from Vermont is recognized. Yeah. I ask unanimous consent that Paul Sheerdewan, that Paul Sheerdewan with the Homeland Security Committee be granted floor privileges for the remainder of the Congress. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. Thank you. Senator from Vermont. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, um, today I am very proud to introduce the Older Americans Act uh, reauthorization bill of 2012 uh, with 14 of my colleagues, uh, including Senators Blumenthal, Kerry, Mikulski, Begich, Akaka, Durbin, Gillibrand, Klobuchar, Leahy, Wyden, Franken, Boxer, Johnson, and Merkley. Uh, this bill is the result of an impressive team effort. We have reached out to a number of members on the committee uh, and others. Uh, who have brought forth ideas of their own. Uh, and I'm very proud as chairman of the Subcommittee on Primary Health and Aging to have introduced uh, this bill. And I want to thank uh, the director of the subcommittee, Ashley Cottingham, for her work, as well as uh, Sophie Casimo and Eric, Erica Solway. Uh, Madam President, it is disappointing to me uh, that this important piece of legislation has not been dealt with uh, during this session. Uh, but on behalf of the millions of elderly people to whom it applies and for whom it will make life better, I am introducing it today because it will lay the groundwork for what we have got to do next session. Uh, Madam President, originally enacted in 1965, the Older American Act Older Americans Act was the first initiative by the federal government to help senior citizens remain independent in their homes and in their communities. The Older Americans Act has historically received bipartisan support. This act provides federal funding for some important programs that many Americans are familiar with. Among others is the Meals on Wheels program. And that means that all over America, uh, we have seniors who are frail, seniors who are unable to leave their homes. And every single day, all over this country, there are volunteers 
who are delivering hot meals, nutritious meals to seniors. And I want to thank all of those volunteers and to tell you that we're going to do the best that we can to increase funding to end some of those waiting lines that now exist throughout this country in terms of seniors being able to get the Meals on Wheels program. And another important nutrition program that the Older Americans Act deals with is the Congregate Meal Program. Uh, in Vermont, and I know all over this country, uh, every day seniors come to senior centers where they're able to socialize, uh, able to have a good time, able to break through their isolation, uh, and also receive nutritious meals. And the meals that they receive are significantly funded by the Congregate Meal Program. Uh, in my view, they are inadequately funded. We want to increase funding for that program as well. I would mention that in the state of Vermont, just one small state, almost one million congregate and Meals on Wheels are served every single year. One million meals in a small state like Vermont. Madam President, we are in the midst of a terrible uh, recession. Uh, unemployment is too high, wages are too low. Uh, many people have lost uh, their homes. But in the midst of this recession, we do not talk enough about the plight of many elderly people. They are living their lives, uh, often in great financial distress, under the radar screen. I think we are not paying enough attention uh, to their problems. Uh, today, incredibly enough, one in five uh, American seniors over the age of 65 are living on an average income of $7,500 per year. And the number, numbers of seniors going hungry is rising. Hunger among seniors in the United States of America today is a serious problem. In fact, there are over 5 million seniors who face the threat of hunger and others who are struggling every single day to make sure that they have enough food in the refrigerator to take care of their most basic needs. Uh, Madam President, the very good news is that the Older Americans Act uh, has developed programs to address these needs. Yet, because we have more seniors uh, who are in need of these programs, it is absolutely imperative that we address the problems of hunger uh, and make sure that every senior in this country gets the nutrition that he or she needs. And this legislation, this bill that we are submitting today with uh, 14 uh, co-sponsors uh, will request higher authorization for nutrition programs, for supportive services, for jobs programs. One of the things that the Older Americans Act does, not a lot of people know this, provides employment opportunities for many seniors. And this is important because it allows hard-pressed seniors to earn additional revenue, but it also allows seniors to go out into the workforce and get meaning into their lives, which is extremely important. This legislation also provides for chronic disease self-management and the long-term care ombudsman program. This bill also strengthens efforts to identify and prevent elder abuse, a serious problem in our country, provides support for family caregivers and care coordination activities, workforce for seniors, and increases protections for seniors living in nursing homes and receiving home care services. Uh, Madam President, we need to see the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act early in the next Congress with 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 each day and middle-class families experiencing rising costs from education to health care, as well as the need to provide care to their aging relatives, we are at a critical moment in terms of how we address the very serious problems facing uh, senior citizens. Now, the interesting point uh, about the Older Americans Act and about the nutrition programs is that while, yes, it is an investment of federal dollars, in the long run, it actually saves us money. We had a very interesting hearing on this issue, and we heard from physicians who told us what kind of common sense would suggest. 
that if seniors do not get the nutrition that they need, if they become malnourished, they are obviously more likely to become ill, end up in the hospital, end up in the emergency room. In addition, when you have senior citizens who are not getting the care they need at home, the attention they need, the nutrition they need, they are more likely to suffer serious falls, break hips, end up in the hospital at great expense. So the bottom line here is not really rocket science, is that if you make sure that seniors throughout this country who are vulnerable, who are frail, who do not have a lot of money, if they get the nutrition and the attention they deserve while at home, they will be healthier, less likely to end up in the hospital and emergency room at great expense to our health care system. So investing in the Older Americans Act is not only the right thing to do, it is not only the humane thing to do in terms of taking care of the most vulnerable and fragile people in our society, it also makes good financial sense for our country. Madam uh, President, I thank very much the 14 co-sponsors that we have, uh, and we are going to aggressively do our best to make sure that this legislation uh, is passed uh, either in the lame duck session or when we return uh, next year. And with that, uh, Madam President, I would yield the floor and note the absence. Oh, yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Minnesota is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would like to associate myself with the remarks of the Senator from Vermont. I am a, one of the co-sponsors of the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. And I just, before I uh, talk about uh, a bill that I've just introduced, I, I just want to say, uh, underscore the fact that the Older Americans Act it was, was introduced in 1965, and it, it, it keeps, it allows seniors to stay in their homes. And it saves money. And um, it costs $6 a day to do Meals on Wheels per senior. And this allows seniors to stay in their home and not go to a nursing home. We know what a nursing home costs every day. So this is an example of just common sense. Seniors want to stay in their homes if they can. And uh, this is, a, a, I've been through the presiding officer in my state of uh, Minnesota doing roundtables on the Older Americans Act. It is a, a great program that we need to re reauthorize in order to, to do a really a common sense thing, which is allow seniors to stay where they want to stay in their home. And, and at the same time, not have them spending the kind of money they would be spending in a nursing home or in, in, in that kind of facility. So uh, I commend uh, the senator from Vermont. Madam President, I rise today to talk about a bill that I've just introduced, uh, the Arbitration Fairness for Students Act, and, uh, and talk about why it's so important to protect our nation's students. Access to Higher education is becoming increasingly important in our nation. In 2018, 70% of the jobs in our state, Madam President, Minnesota, will require some post-secondary education. But we must also make sure that access to higher education remains, a, it stays a positive experience and not a damaging one. Colleges and universities need to deliver on the promises that they make to students, and if they don't, students need to be able to hold them accountable. That's why I've introduced this bill today, along with Senator Harkin and six co-sponsors, including Senator Sanders. It would prohibit any school participating in the Title IV federal student aid system from forcing its students to forego access to the courts when they have a valid dispute and instead forcing them into private arbitration proceedings. This bill is simply about accountability. It's about the basic American right to seek justice in our court system, a right that is 
unfortunately being denied now to thousands of students today after the landmark Supreme Court decision in the AT&T uh, Mobility, the Concepcion case. A recent report from Public Citizen and the National Association of Consumer Advocates highlights how that decision is harming students. Before that decision, thousands of students who had attended a chain of culinary schools formed a class action lawsuit alleging that the school had exaggerated the salaries of its graduates and they won. The students received payments of up to $20,000 each, which they desperately needed since, according to the lawsuits, these students typically had more than $40,000 in student loan debt. But that was before the Concepcion decision, which now allows corporations to block class action lawsuits for the use of mandatory arbitration clauses in their employee contract or in their contracts. Now, a group of students that can prove that they were lied to by their college can be barred from accessing our court system. I think that's wrong and my bill would change that. But don't just take that from me. Take it from judges who are ruling in the post-Concepcion world and who feel that students are being hurt. In one recent case, students alleged that a school misrepresented basic facts like the cost of education and the school's accreditation status. The students even showed that they had to sign the enrollment contract which contained the mandatory arbitration clause before they were allowed to speak to financial aid counselors. The court ruled against the students citing the Concepcion decision. According to the court, quote, the argument had considerable validity and the court would likely have found the arbitration agreements at issue here unconscionable if it were issuing this decision pre-Concepcion, unquote. The, co the court also said that Concepcion, quote, likely foreclosed the possibility of any recovery for many wronged individuals, unquote, end quote. As I said, this bill is about accountability. It's, a, it's also about college affordability. Our higher education system often requires students to take on tens of thousands of dollars in debt. In exchange for this debt, students believe they are receiving an education that will allow them to pay that money back, often because that's exactly what the school is telling them. But what if the school is, is lying? Students need to be able to hold those schools accountable for their actions. Otherwise, what's going to stop other schools from charging whatever they want and convincing their students that they can afford it by lying? Now, we can stop these anti-consumer, anti-student contracts, and my bill would do just that. Congress has acted several times to protect individual industries from abuse of mandatory arbitration clauses. In 2001, Congress heard from William Shack, a longtime automobile dealer from Nevada. He told his story to Congress about how he and a partner had been working together to open a Saturn dealership, investing a lot of money, when Saturn suddenly pulled the deal. As the result of the arbitration clause in their contract, Mr. Shack and his partner were required to arbitrate the dispute. In his testimony, he said that federal legislation was the only remedy available to protect auto dealers from the imposition of these unfair contract provisions and to prevert, uh, preserve state procedural and substantive protections. He explained, quote, we reject categorically the idea that we voluntarily agreed to submit 
to mandatory binding arbitration, end quote. The most compelling portion of Mr. Shack's testimony was this, and I quote again. The dispute drove home to us in a drastic fashion just how one-sided the mandatory binding arbitration process can be for dealers. We were surprised to learn that despite the great system of justice that we have in this country, we could be deprived of the basic right to an impartial decision on the merits of our case. That is a grave injustice." Unquote. In response to stories like Mr. Shack's, Senator Orrin Hatch introduced the Motor Vehicle Franchise Contract Arbitration Fairness Act. The bill had 66 co-sponsors an equal number of Democrats and Republicans. Unsurprisingly, there was opposition to this legislation. The Chamber of Commerce testified against it. But Congress decided to prioritize the rights of auto dealers to seek justice in our courts. And in November of 2002, Congress passed this, this bill, passed, made it law. Today, auto dealers cannot be bound by mandatory arbitration provisions in their contracts with their manufacturers. This change didn't result in a flood of litigation. It simply provided some equal footing for small auto dealerships to bargain with the large manufacturers. Once Congress determined that this particular industry was subject to abuse, it took action to protect the vulnerable party. Congress again acted in 2007 to protect members of our armed services. Congress heard from military leaders that predatory lended, lender, let me say that again, that predatory lending targeted at our nation's service members was impairing our country's military readiness. In response, Republican Senator Jim Talent from Missouri along with his colleague, Senator Bill Nelson, Florida, Democrat, introduced an amendment to the 2006 National Defense Authorization Bill. Their provision prohibited predatory lending practices, including a prohibition on enforcing mandatory arbitration clauses in financial agreements with service members. This amendment passed the Senate unanimously and went into effect in 2007. Despite strong opposition from the Wall Street lobby, Congress came together in a bipartisan manner to target abuses against our service members. In addition to auto dealers and service members, Congress has also taken up the plight of poultry growers. In a 2007 hearing, in the Senate Agriculture Committee, one witness shared this terrible story. Gertrude Overstreet was a 67-year-old contract poultry farmer. She operated two chicken houses. So her total monthly income, including food stamps, was less than $1,000 a month for her and her husband. Mrs. Overstreet had a 10th grade education. When the poultry producer for whom she worked violated the terms of their agreement, the company required Mrs. Overstreet to bring her claim into arbitration where she was required to pay $27,000 in upfront costs before she could even get a hearing. Mrs. Overstreet didn't know what arbitration was or that her legal remedies had been stripped from her. This is an elderly couple who could not afford the cost of their medication, much less $20,000 in upfront arbitration fees. This might be the most compelling example of disparate bargaining power. A giant poultry processor versus Mrs. Overstreet. But Senator Grassley took up this cause and introduced the Fair Contracts 
for Growers Act. Thanks to his efforts, when the Farm Bill passed the following year, it included provisions that enabled poultry farmers to opt out of mandatory arbitration clauses imposed by the big processors. Most recently, Congress took up an amendment that I introduced in the National Defense Authorization Bill in the fall of 2009. Some of the most offensive uses of mandatory arbitration clauses that I've seen are by the overseas military contractors against women who have been victimized on the job. Too many women working for military contractors have had to endure unimaginable workplace harassment and, and violence. Those women deserve their right to a day in court, just like the auto dealers, the service members, the poultry farmers. Once again, the amendment passed with broad bipartisan support. Once again, Congress took steps to tackle the most egregious abuses of mandatory arbitration. When confronted with a group that has been victimized by mandatory arbitration clauses, Congress has repeatedly taken steps to protect the little guy and the right to a day in court. And we have done so on a bipartisan basis. I believe Minnesota's students and students across the country deserve the same protection that we have afforded to auto dealers, the service members, to poultry farmers, and employees of military contractors. The Arbitration Fairness for Students Act would provide that protection, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor. And I would suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. President. 
The Senator from Iowa is recognized. Madam President, I ask that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that Mike Sabosky and Peter Visser of my staff be granted four privileges for the duration of today's proceedings. Without objection, so ordered. Madam President, uh, today, as I have done every day uh, that we've been in session since we returned from our August uh, break, uh, I've been talking about the impact of the Ryan budget, which is now the Romney-Ryan budget, on America and what it would mean for our future. So I take the floor today, as I have in the past, to talk about one aspect of it. In the past, I've talked about the impact on health care, uh, on education, uh, on the social safety net. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about what, we're going to, what the Romney-Ryan budget does to our infrastructure, to job training, to avenues to the middle class for people. The real question that the American people face this coming election is, are we going to restore and rebuild the middle class, or are we going to continue to shift even more and more of our wealth to just a few at the top at the expense of the middle class? Now, my Republican friends have made clear where they stand on this. They did so when nearly every Republican in Congress voted in favor of the Ryan budget plan, which Governor Romney embraced as marvelous. Well, the very centerpiece of the Ryan budget is a dramatic shift of even more wealth to those at the top. Huge new tax cuts for the richest 2%. Those making more than a million dollars a year would get an extra $394,000 a year in tax breaks under the Ryan budget. Now, that's on top of the 265,000 uh, uh, that they already have. So that brings it up to well over 400, almost $500,000 a year that they would get. Now, we keep hearing a lot of talk about entitlements for the poor. You know, uh, that's when we hear Governor Romney talk about entitlements, he always focuses on the poor. How about this? This is an entitlement. If you make over a million dollars, you're entitled to it. Well, you won't hear him talking about that entitlement. So how do the Republicans and the Ryan budget, how do they pay for these huge new tax cuts that total $4.5 trillion over 10 years? Well, the Romney-Ryan budget would partially offset the tax cuts by making deep, draconian cuts to programs that undergird the middle class and are essential to the quality of life in this country. As I said, everything from education, student grants and loans, to highways, bridges, other infrastructure projects. Lastly, the Romney-Ryan budget offsets big new tax cuts for those at the top by actually raising taxes on the middle class. Yes, you heard me. That is exactly right. The Nonpartisan Tax Policy Center estimates that under the Ryan plan, middle class families with children would see their taxes go up on average by more than $2,000. The bottom line is that the Ryan budget does not reduce the deficit. The savings they gain by slashing spending, raising taxes on the middle class, basically go to offsetting the $4.5 trillion in new tax cuts which I just pointed out, go to the wealthiest Americans. The, uh, I think this uh, shows you right here about what's happening to the deficit. We always hear talks about balancing the budget. Well, the truth is Representative Ryan and Mr. Romney are not interested in balancing the budget. Their plan would not balance the budget until 2040, 28 years from now. 28 years from now. As I said earlier, that Mr. Ryan is a true acolyte of former Vice President Cheney, who in an unguarded moment said that deficits don't matter. That was Vice President Cheney. Well, if you look at the debt piled up under the Bush years, you'll see that they didn't think deficits matter. And look at this. Here's the debt held by the public under the Ryan budget going from 2013 just to 2022 in the next 10 years. Look at the debt. The debt goes up. It doesn't go down. And where does this debt go? Tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. That's where it goes. Ron, uh, Representative Ryan doubles down on the theory that if we give an even greater share of wealth to those at the top, it will magically trickle down. A theory that was tried under President George W. Bush. But in the years after those Bush tax cuts, we know what happened uh, to the jobs in America. They plummeted. They plummeted in the years after George Bush and those tax cuts went into effect. Now, 
Today, I just want to focus specifically on the impact of the Romney-Ryan budget on our nation's infrastructure and job training. Both, I believe, are crucial for the creation of middle-class jobs in a competitive global economy. Regrettably, the Ryan budget would be a devastating one-two punch to our nation's economy. It would drastically slash investment in infrastructure. That would destroy hundreds of thousands of well-paying jobs. It would radically reduce funding for job training, reducing opportunities for the unemployed to get retooled for jobs in sectors of the economy where they're needed. Mr. Madam President, the United States now competes in a global marketplace. To improve our competitiveness and to give our workers the education and skills they need to compete, both our public and private sectors must make robust investments in infrastructure, education, job training. Overcrowded and crumbling roads, outdated waterways, other means of transportation and transport have a profoundly damaging effect on our economy. This increases the time and expense of moving goods. It hurts our global competitiveness, as I said, especially at a time when our rivals in the global marketplace are investing heavily in both infrastructure and job training. Even maintaining our current levels of infrastructure investment will have negative consequences for our economy. That's if we just maintain what we have. The American Society of Civil Engineers predicts that if current trends continue by 2020, our deteriorating infrastructure will result in 900,000 fewer jobs and $900 billion in lost economic growth. Now, this was the American Society of Civil Engineers in 2011, said that the deficiencies in America's roads, bridges, and transit systems cost households and businesses roughly $130 billion, including approximately $97 billion in vehicle operating costs. You can read that to mean potholes and things that bang your car up. $32 billion in delays in travel time, if you've been stuck in a lot of traffic. $1.2 billion in safety costs and $590 million in environmental costs. That's the Society of Civil Engineers. Now, that's not an arm of the Democratic Party or any party. This is, this is, this is really a, a very nonpartisan economic look at what's happening in our infrastructure. So by slashing these investments to even lower levels, the Ryan budget will only make these problems worse, not better. In fact, the Ryan budget cuts transportation spending by one-third in the first year. I mean, we're not talking about a little nip and a tuck on infrastructure. Here is the fiscal year 2012 enacted transportation budget, $89 billion. The Ryan Romney budget for next year, $57 billion, almost a one-third cut. Think what that would mean to the jobs in America. Think what it means to our crumbling infrastructure. And then you have to compare how much we're investing in our infrastructure to what one of our biggest competitors, China, is doing. So here's China, as a percent of their gross domestic product, GDP, they're spending 9% on infrastructure of their GDP. Here's the United States in 1960, when I was a college student working summer jobs, working laying pavement and building bridges on the interstate highway system, we were spending 4% of our GDP on infrastructure. We're now down to 2.4%. And the Romney-Ryan budget would take that even lower. So already, our federal investments in infrastructure are inadequate. For example, we have failed to bring the half-century-old interstate highway system into the 21st century. Again, the Romney-Ryan budget would make that even worse. The Ryan budget would make deep cuts to funding for the Corps of Engineers, which is already grossly underfunded and struggling to maintain a deteriorating waterway system, so crucial for the movement of bulk goods and I might add, also crucial for flood control. Madam President, the Ryan budget also would take a meat ax to federal funding for job training and education, America's pathway to the middle class. It would jeopardize vital job services for millions of Americans. 31 million Americans got federal help with their job searches last year, helped to write their resumes, prepare for interviews, 
information about the best jobs available in their local area, referrals to job openings. Several hundred thousand were also able to participate in job training under federal programs. This gave these American workers the opportunity to compete for good jobs so they have a shot at the middle class. It created a steady supply of skilled workers for U.S. businesses, made their production, their operations more productive, and it helped them to grow. Think about that. Several hundred thousand people out of work were able to participate in job training because of federal programs. You know, that's part of Mr. Romney's 47 percent that he says he doesn't care about, that are the takers in our society. No, no, Mr. Romney. They're not takers. These are people struggling to make a better life for themselves and their families. They want job training. They want better education. They want to upgrade their skills. They want to work. The Romney-Ryan budget would pull the rug out from underneath them and say, tough luck, you're on your own. Well, I don't think they should be there on their own. They should be part of our American family. Without sustained, robust investments in quality infrastructure and well-trained workers, America will fall behind, job creation will suffer. This is a critical threat to the future of the middle class in our country. So, Madam President, in essence, the Ryan budget essentially rejects the very possibility that the federal government can act to spur economic growth, boost competitiveness, and create good middle-class jobs. But this flies in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. At critical junctures, going back to the beginning of our republic, the federal government has stepped up to the plate, acting decisively to spur economic growth, foster innovation, and help create jobs. 1791, Alexander Hamilton presented to Congress his landmark Report on Manufactures, a set of federal policies designed to strengthen the new republic's economy by creating a network of roads and canals. The most visionary 19th century advocate of federal investments to spur economic growth was the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln. In 1862, he signed the, the uh, Pacific Railway Act, authorizing federal land grants to finance construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, one of the great technological feats, by the way, of the 19th century. But Lincoln did much more. He created the Department of Agriculture to modernize U.S. agriculture and distribute land to farmers. And as a proud graduate of Iowa State University, I also note that Lincoln dramatically expanded access to higher education across the United States by signing into law land-grant college system. Now, taken together, these initiatives had a transformative impact on the U.S. economy. You know, it's humorous to imagine how today's Republicans would have reacted to Lincoln's agenda. What if Abraham Lincoln were to present this today to the Tea Party? He wouldn't get anywhere. Later, 1950s, there was another Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, who championed one of the greatest public works projects in American history, construction of our national interstate highway system. A 1996 study concluded that the interstate highway system is an engine that has driven 40 years of unprecedented prosperity in America. In recent times, the federal government has funded and spearheaded scientific discovery and innovation. The Department of Defense, of Defense really invented the Internet. It was federal research that led to the in invention of the global positioning satellite system. Mr. President, any discussion of the federal government's historic role in discovery and innovation and job creation must acknowledge the staggering achievements of the National Institutes of Health. More than 80 Nobel Prizes have been awarded for NIH-supported research. So it's absurd to claim that the federal government cannot play a positive and even profound role in boosting the economy and spurring innovation. But the Romney-Ryan budget demands that we permanently hobble the federal government. That's the Romney-Ryan budget. This negative, defeatist viewpoint is dead wrong and the disinvestment that it advocates will set our country into a death spiral of stagnation and decline. Going back to the 1930s, the American people have supported and strengthened a kind of a unique American social contract. 
The social contract says that a cardinal role of government is to provide a ladder of opportunity so that every American can realistically aspire to the American dream. The Ryan budget would rip up that social contract. Don't take my word for it. Former Ronald Reagan economist, economic advisor Bruce Bartlett on the Ryan budget said this, quote, distributionally, the Ryan plan is a monstrosity. The rich would receive huge tax cuts while the social safety net would be shredded to pay for them. Shredded to pay for them. Well, Mr. President, the Ryan budget rips up the social safety net, disinvests in our infrastructure, cuts funding for job training, cuts money for education, cuts money for health care. As I said, it is a negative, defeatist viewpoint that will set our country into a death spiral of stagnation and decline. The Romney-Ryan budget would replace that unique American social contract that we have with a survival of the fittest, winner-take-all philosophy that tells struggling, aspiring Americans and their communities, tough luck, you're on your own. Mr. President, I agree with former President Bill Clinton. We have two philosophies here. The Romney-Ryan budget, tough luck, you're on your own, or the other philosophy, that we're all Americans and we're all in this together. We're all mutually supportive. We believe in a ladder or ramp of opportunity. And yes, we believe the federal government has a powerful role to play in making sure that all Americans can aspire to the American dream, that can reach the middle class, can achieve to the highest of their potentialities and their abilities. That's the difference. I think the American people need to know, need to know what's in that Ryan budget. And you might say, well, a budget's a budget. A budget's a blueprint. Just as you build a building, you have to have a blueprint. Well, a budget is a blueprint for the future of where you want to go. Communities have budgets, families have budgets, schools have budgets. You have a budget so you, you can plan. It's where you want to be in the future. The, the Ryan budget is a blueprint for defeat and a death spiral into stagnation for America. And I believe the more that the American people understand and know what's in that Ryan budget, the more they're going to they're turn it aside and say, no, we can do better that in than that in America. We need a budget that reflects our hopes and aspirations and our ability as Americans to work together to achieve the American dream for all. Mr. President, that I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The pending business here in the Senate, the temporary spending bill that would fund the federal government through March of next year. Uh, that measure passed the House last week. And earlier today, the Senate blocked another bill that would have established a $1 billion jobs program, uh, putting veterans back to work, tending to the country's federal lands, and bolstering local police and fire departments. Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa, on the Labor and Pensions Committee, he's the chairman of that committee, was on Washington Journal talking about the fiscal cliff. Uh, those are uh, budget cuts and tax increases set to happen in January. Now, Senator Tom Harkin, a Democrat from Iowa, joins us now to discuss a number of legislative issues facing Congress right now. But, Senator, if you would, want to get your take on Governor Romney's comments about the 47 percent of Americans that he says are uh, dependent on the government. Well, first of all, I find it very startling that someone of his uh, uh, stature and someone who's been in government as long as he in business would, would actually say something like that, uh, especially in an unguarded moment, because that sort of gives you an idea of what he's thinking. Uh, I mean, I don't know who he includes that 47 percent. Does he include students who are getting loans to get through college or elderly who rely upon Social Security or veterans who are using the GI Bill? Uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, I, I've often said the government is there to help provide a ladder of opportunity. Uh, and that's everything from education to, uh, to job training, uh, Social Security, uh, uh, disability. There's a lot of things that, uh, that we do together uh, that really enhances us as individuals. And it seems like uh, Governor Romney simply wants to shred uh, that kind of a social contract that is, I think, kind of uniquely American. Uh, Bruce Bartlett, who was a, an economic advisor to President Reagan, uh, said, and I've been using his quote on, that, on the Senate floor, he said that the Ryan budget uh, uh, distributionally was a monstrosity monstrosity because it shreds the social contract which we have built up here in America over the last well at least over the last 100 years so I, I just the I just warm call be lifted without objection be allowed to speak mr. president um, the Senate's sort of wrapping up its uh, if it, its business uh, if you will until uh, after the election and uh, it's ironic in a way that um, there are so many big issues in front of us as a nation, so many challenges. And we're here talking about things that uh, I'm sure are important, but once again punting, kicking the can down the road on all the big crises that are in front of us as a nation. And I have to say, Mr. President, that never before have a president and a Senate done so little when the nation's challenges are so great. Uh, people have talked about the, the fiscal cliff repeatedly, and people have talked about the uh, fiscal crisis that we find ourselves in, in, um, in terms that I think ought to frighten all Americans, certainly ought to frighten members of Congress. We've talked about the most predictable crisis in, in, in American history, probably in human history. We, it's not like it's any surprise what's going to happen. We're repeatedly reminded by uh, all the experts that if we don't deal with this issue of the fiscal cliff, that it's going to have devastating, catastrophic impacts on our economy, on our national security, uh, on our country, on the American people. And yet we are not addressing and doing the things that we should be doing to, uh, to avert that disaster that's ahead of us, the fiscal cliff that faces us um, on January 1 of this next year. And it's not as if there aren't already lots of, there isn't already a lot of evidence that that we've got big problems. We just crossed the $16 trillion level in terms of our debt. We've added over a trillion dollars to the debt every single year now for the past four years since President Obama has taken office. That's $50,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. Everybody in America, man, woman, or child, has as their share now of the federal debt uh, $50,000. So it is, a, it is a fiscal crisis unlike anything that we've seen before, and it has, as I said, been predicted. The Congressional Budget Office has said that if we don't deal with the fiscal cliff, uh, that it will plunge the economy into recession. They've suggested that it will uh, reduce by 2.9 percent the size of the economy. It would actually have a contraction in the economy in the first six months of next year. They've also projected that it would drive unemployment above 9 percent. 
Now, granted, we're over 8% today. We've been at 8% now for 43 consecutive months. That's the longest stretch in history. In fact, if you go back to the time when the Bureau of Labor Statistics started keeping unemployment data, and you add up the 11 presidents from Harry Truman up through the end of the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, about 60 years, there were 39 months where the unemployment rate exceeded 8%. That's 11 presidents in about 60 years of history where we've had unemployment above 8%. We've now had unemployment above 8% for 43 consecutive months. So 39 months in the first 60 years since they started keeping data, 43 months now in a row uh, under the current administration. You have the Federal Reserve telling us that if we don't deal with our fiscal crisis that uh, the economy is going to soften next year. You have ratings agencies like Moody suggesting that if we don't have a plan in place not only to deal with the sequest sequester that's going to occur at the end of the year in a way that is paid for, but also to deal with the longer structural problem that we have, the debt and the deficit crisis that we have in this country, that we are facing a downgrade in our credit rating. Uh, you had the World Economic Forum come out here just recently with their assessment about the, the world's most competitive economies. And back in January of 2009, when President Obama took office, the World Economic Forum found that the United States had the most, the number one most competitive economy in the world. In terms of global competitiveness, the United States was ranked number one. Now we have dropped. We dropped to fifth. And this year, just recently, as I mentioned, when they came out with their current rankings, uh, the United States had dropped down to seventh. So in a short four-year time span, we've gone from first, in terms of global competitiveness, down to seventh. Now, that, that doesn't speak well for the steps that are being taken here in this country to make America competitive in the global economy, to deal with the problems of spending and debt and the fiscal cliff that's ahead of us. It was interesting to note that the World Economic Forum, what did they point to in terms of their analysis? Why did they come to the conclusion that the United States had fallen from first uh, in January of 2009 when the president took office to seventh here this year? Well, they pointed out spending, debt, taxes, regulations, red tape, all the things that come from Washington, D.C., all the things that are controlled by policies here in Washington. The regulations that continue to spin out of various government agencies that drive up the cost of doing business in this country make us less competitive. The higher taxes that are being assessed on our economy in so many different ways, and of course the, all the taxes that are going to take hold, take effect uh, as part of Obamacare, the health care law that was passed a couple of years ago, begin to kick in. And so you're going to have higher taxes. You've got the, the, the red tape associated with doing business in this country and the, the bureaucracies, the mandates, the, the requirements that are imposed on our small businesses and our job creators. And then, of course, as I said, you've got this massive amount of debt that hangs like a cloud uh, over our economy in this country. All factors that contribute to this assessment that has basically downgraded the United States from the number one uh, position in terms of global competitiveness down to number seven. And so the, the question before the House is, uh, what can we do? What should we be doing to avert that crisis? Well, it strikes me at least that uh, it starts with having a plan and working together, having the president step forward with a plan that would uh, uh, make sure that our economy doesn't go into a recession next year, that makes sure that the uh, defense cuts that would occur under the sequester, which are terribly disproportionate relative to the size of the defense budget as a percentage of our total budget, uh, don't harm our national security interests, figure out ways to, to uh, solve that problem, to reduce spending in other areas, to redistribute those cuts. Defense represents only 20% of our entire budget, but it gets 50% of the cuts under this uh, across-the-board sequester that would take effect on January 1st of this year. Uh, our national security experts, our military leadership have said that if these cuts take effect, that we would have the smallest army since the beginning of World War II. You have to go back to 1940 to find a time when we would have an army that's that small. Uh, you'd have to go back to 1915, before World War I, to find a time when we have a, would have a navy that is as small as it would be if these cuts take effect and the number of ships that we have at our disposal. And we would have the smallest air force, literally, in the history of the air force. That's what our military leadership is telling us will happen 
if these devastating cuts take effect. You've had the Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, the President's own uh, Secretary, uh, say that this would be catastrophic, that these cuts would be disastrous. You have the service chiefs saying the very same thing. Uh, and so we've got all this, all this right in front of us, staring us in the face. And instead of dealing with that crisis, uh, we're putting bills on the floor that really uh, don't have near the consequences I said. I'm sure important. I'm not uh, denigrating at all any of the legislation that the Senate's considering, but it seems to be right now geared a lot more toward the election than it is about saving the country and doing the things that are necessary to avoid this, uh, this cliff that's ahead of us and all the disastrous consequences that could come with it. Now, just as a uh, again, a point of fact, and I mentioned this before, but we've had now over 43 months or 43 months of 8% 8, 8 unemployment or above. We've got 23 million Americans who are either unemployed or underemployed. Uh, we have seen the data continues to suggest how sluggish our economy is, the impact that it's having on the middle class in this country. In fact, middle class Americans are continually hit by uh, continued bad news. And you start with the fact that uh, since President Obama took office, average incomes have gone down almost $4,000. Uh, you add on top of that the fact that fuel prices have literally doubled in that time frame, now more than doubled. In fact, we hit in the month of September, this month, the highest fuel price ever for the month of September. And that's a cost that is borne by middle class Americans. Uh, that's one of the biggest costs, biggest expenses in their lives is dealing with getting their kids to and from school, getting to work. Uh, taking care of just the day-to-day -day activities that they're responsible for, the cost of fuel is a very important pocketbook issue to middle-class Americans. And then you have news that the Kaiser Foundation uh, came out with that, that says that health care costs, health care premiums, have gone up by 29 percent. Now that is despite all the assertions when Obamacare was being debated that it would drive health care costs down. In fact, the president, as he campaigned for office, four years ago talked about bringing the average premium for an average family, I should say the premium for an average family, down by $2,500. Well, the opposite has happened. According to the Kaiser Foundation, health insurance costs have gone up by 29%. And instead of coming down by $2,500 for the average family, they've gone up by over $3,000 for the average family. So whether it's health care costs, fuel costs, uh, tuition costs, which by the way have gone up by 25 percent, uh, you see this the, in, in average incomes which have gone down, you see this worsening picture for middle class Americans. And all of that will be dramatically complicated by what's going to happen on January 1st if we don't take action to avert that crisis. And what happens January 1st, as I mentioned, you've got a across the board cut uh, that, that it's across the board in the sense that everything gets hit, but not everything gets hit proportionally. Defense, as I said, gets 50 percent of the cuts, uh, although it represents only 20 percent of the budget. But you're going to have all these uh, cuts that take effect that hurt the national security budget and the jobs that go with that. But you also have, you also have taxes going up. Tax rates go up on January 1st that will absolutely devastate uh, job creation in this country if they're allowed to take effect. In fact, um, the total amount of tax increases that will hit us on January 1st if Congress doesn't take action over a 10-year period is about $5 trillion, about $5 trillion uh, over a 10-year period in additional taxes. And even if you say, as the President does, that we want taxes just to go up on people who make more than $200,000 a year or uh, couples who make more than $250,000 a year, you are harming almost a million small businesses, the very people that we're looking to to create the jobs to get the economy moving again. Almost a million small businesses who file income tax uh, returns, uh, they are passed through entities or flow through entities organized as subchapter S corporations or LLCs and therefore uh, they, they file their business income on their individual tax return, would see their taxes go up. Almost a million small businesses who represent uh, you know, 25 percent of the workforce, or higher 25 percent of the workforce in this country. And so that, that is a, a, uh, a huge tax increase that is facing job creators in this country come January 1 of this year. So, Mr. President, these are things that the, the Congress, the United States Senate, the President of the United States ought to be focused on. And yet we aren't getting that focus. In fact, it's hard to get even information from the President of the United States about how he would implement the sequestration uh, proposal. 
And we had uh, passed legislation earlier this summer, which he signed into law in, in August, which required him to submit to the Congress a proposal for how he would implement sequestration. We finally, after the delay, missed the deadline, received that last week. But again, it lacks specificity, it lacks detail. Uh, Congress asked to have that on a program uh, project specific uh, area and uh, we didn't get that and so as a consequence uh, again still operating without the information that's necessary to do something to replace uh, that, uh, that sequestration. And I have to say that um, the House of Representatives has attempted, they passed in their budget and the subsequent reconciliation bill that went with it, a replacement for this sequestration so that we wouldn't have this uh, half a trillion dollar cut in our national security budget and all the um, attendant problems and, and, and risks that come with that. And yet uh, that wasn't picked up, that wasn't acted on here in the United States Senate. And so um, unfortunately we are where we are, which is uh, we're going into the election season now. We haven't dealt with the across the board cuts, the sequestration. We haven't dealt with the issue of taxes going up on January 1st on the people who create jobs in this country. And for that reason, we've got all these analysts, independent analysts, government analysts, concluding the same thing. And that is we are headed for a train wreck. And that's what we ought to be focused on, Mr. President, right now. And, and frankly, that's not going to happen unless we get some leadership from the President of the United States. You've got to have the President engaged, involved in these discussions if we're going to try and solve this problem. And I, I, um, I would hope that the leadership here in the United States Senate would be a partner to that as well. I know that there are Republicans here. Uh, we have tried to get votes on uh, ways to replace the sequestration or, or come up with a substitute for the defense cuts that it includes. We have uh, tried and actually gotten some votes on extending the tax rates at the end of the year, but that was voted down here. Um, but the Democrat leadership in the United States Senate has got to be a party to the discussions, as does the President of the United States, in order for us to do what's necessary to avert what we know is going to be a calamity come January 1, unless we change course. And so, Mr. President, I would, uh, as, we, as we begin to conclude the, this particular session of the Senate, I see my colleague from Wyoming, uh, the Senator from uh, Wyoming, Senator Barrasso, is here, physician and doctor, I know, who uh, uh, has spoken at great length about the impact of many of the policies that are coming out of Washington on our small businesses, on our middle class, and I certainly uh, would uh, want to give him an opportunity to, to make some observations about that as well. But uh, I just want to conclude by saying that I hope that before um, this catastrophe hits us, that we have the foresight and the willingness to take on and the courage to take on these big issues. And you can't solve big issues in this city without leadership. And that's going to take leadership from the President of the United States. It's going to take leadership in the United States Senate. And as I stand here today, we haven't seen that. We haven't passed a budget in three years. We haven't dealt with any of the long-term problems that are posed and raised by the fiscal cliff that hits us on January the 1st of this year. Uh, I hope that changes. I hope we see that leadership. And I hope that we can get this country back on track. Mr. President, I yield the floor. President. The Senator from Wyoming. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I uh, would like to associate myself with the remarks of the Senator from South Dakota who 